So our next talk is by Natalie Frank from Vassar College, and she's going to speak about a class of two-dimensional model sets from one-dimensional substitutions. Thanks, Niku. Um, so obviously, want to thank the organizers for having us, having me speak here, and I want to thank Bob for allowing us to celebrate him with this with this conference. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking about. So it's just all pictures and examples. So enjoy. <laughs> I tried to write something that might might be entertaining for Bob. So um, so I'm basically. I threw the word model sets in there because we are going to be computing some windows and, and so forth. But really, this talk is about what I call direct product variation tilings. So um, I'm starting with the usual Fibonacci substitution that everybody likes to play with from my field. Um, so the substitution itself, this is a symbolic substitution. You have some alphabet. Wait, I have to figure out where I'm pointing this thing. Ah, yeah. OK. You have some alphabet A, B, and you replace every time you see an A, you're going to replace it by an A, B. And when you see a B, you're going to replace it with an A. Um, whoops, hold on. All right, so um, I don't think I can point this. I don't think I can aim this. Okay, so if you iterate your substitution, um, you create larger and larger words, which you can then use as like a pre-language for a subshift. So you, you, um, you consider all infinite sequences on A's and B's um, that where all the words look like these words. So, um, all right, so um, I'm gonna turn these into tilings. Uh, so there's a matrix of substitution that um, comes along with any substitution rule. So the first column is telling you the population of the substitution of A. And in our case, there's one A and one B. Um, and the population of a substituted B is just a single A and no Bs. And when you take the um, eigenstuff of that matrix, the large, the prone free B, Frobenius eigenvalue is the golden mean. Um, and so this matrix gives you, um, you can get a measure out of this thing. The matrix gives the relative frequencies and um, it also gives you the sort of natural tile length so that you can move from being a symbolic substitution into having some inflate and subdivide rule. And this thing is very uh, well understood. Um, so to turn it into a tiling, you, you get yourselves, you get yourself two tiles. Um, an A tile is longer, it's of length tau, and the B tile is shorter, it's of length one. And if I expand, so this arrow here um, is inflation by a factor of tau. And so I stretch this by a factor of tau and it, it subdivides perfectly into, um, the two tiles A and B. And I can iterate this thing just as we iterated the substitution before, and you end up laying down these tiles um, in an order that's just like the order you saw for sequences. And this thing, um, you can make a hull out of the infinite tilings that you get of the line, um, but I don't need to talk about that right now. So I wanted to talk about a way to see this. So these figures are a little embarrassing, but um, so what you can do if you want is um, think of A as being a vector one zero, and you can think of B as being the vector zero one. We take our same substitution matrix, matrices, matrix, and um, what happens is if I apply that matrix over and over again to the vector A, I end up with the population vector of the word that's been substituted n times of type A. So, um, and this, visually you can see this as um, just simply, whoops, just simply taking a step to the right when you see an A. So we see A, B, A, A, B, A, B, A. And you make this, this thing that um, you could call a staircase. 
And if you take this staircase and follow my, my wonderful projection lines, so this, this thing here is the right Perone Frobenius eigenline. And this is the right, uh, like, weakly expanding eigenline. And um, so if you project along the weak eigenline to get onto here, um, you get the, you get the, um, you get the same tiling we had before. And this is the right. <laughs> Like my little dots, they're pretty good, right? Um, and this is supposed to look like the tiling with the natural tile length. So just on the on the eigenline here, you reproduce the the endpoints from the from the Fibonacci self similar tiling. And so, if you want to. Um, you can send this down to the weak eigenline and create um, the window, which um, is this green and blue thing. And so it's a projection onto the weak eigenspace of just literally the endpoints, right? the, the vertices that are on the staircase. Um, and when you project those down, they fill up the, the, the A types fill up this, I think, I mean, this is just like, it's not precisely done. Um, and I, I don't know whether, but um, so what you end up with is a piece of the window that catches all of the vertices that belong to the A, and you have a piece of the window that picks up all the vertices that belong to the B. And so this thing in the eigenspace um, is a window. Um, and so what happens is you can get renormalization equations out of this. Um, so if you take this eigenline because of the fact that multiplication by M um, gives you the population vectors for substituted words that guarantees that when you substitute by m or sorry multiply any element of on your lattice by m you're going to end up inside of the lattice and so that allows us actually to um, to come up with the renormalization scheme. So the idea is that every, every point on the staircase is either the start of a substituted word or somewhere inside of a substituted word. Um, and so you can, um, and the substituted words start at, you know, just take any vector that was already in the lattice performing the substitution is going to take that point, uh, multiply it by M, and then um, you're going to stick whatever sequence of ups and rights on that go with the substitution of whatever letter you were at. And so then you can ask the question, well, where are the A's going to be? The A's are, the A's appear as the first letter of the substitution of an A. And they appear as the first letter in a substitution of B. Um, so I know that all of the A's are just M times all of the A's or B's. Um, so they're just the start of a supertile. So when you multiply by M, you end up at the start of a supertile again. The B's, they're not at the start. And they only show, they show up as the second letter in an A, in the substitution of an A. And that's the only place. Um, and so you end up knowing that everything, every B shows up somewhere in the substituted uh, letter, substituted A, and then moved over by the amount it needs to be moved over. And so since you have this, um, I mean, this thing is an iterated function system. Well, it's not yet, but it will be when you do it on the window. So when you do uh, this process on the lattice, you can look at the projection down in the window and um, that's in the weak direction. So multiplying by my matrix N, M is, um, is actually creating this 
iterated function system on the attract on the um, in the weak eigenspace. And so if you take the attractor of that thing, you end up with basically the window um, with an extra point. Okay, so um, is Lorenzo here? Yes. I wonder if he likes the name I came up with. So this, <laughs> I made up, this is a really simple example of a two-dimensional thing. So this is the, this is now what I'm talking about of the two-dimensional model set idea. So you take the regular old Fibonacci in one direction, and then vertically, I just take this non-recognizable, just doubling substitution, could call it a solenoid. Um, and you end up, if, if you cross these two alphabets, you end up with a, just a two letter alphabet. And so I inherit a substitution on this thing by just um, horizontally, you just run the, right? Horizontally, you just run Fibonacci. So little a goes to little a, little b at both levels. And little b goes to little a. And then in the vertical direction, just A goes to AA. So there's not a lot happening, right? This is as simple, this is the simplest possible one I could come up with. And I wanted to come up with something this small because I wanted to be able to draw that staircase picture for you. So that staircase picture exists for these things um, regardless, but uh, this one I can actually draw it in the number of dimensions we have available. So, um, so if you want to make the canonical tiles, so working with um, the natural tile lengths so that you can get um, and iterate and inflate and subdivide rule, um, then you need this as your expanding matrix, your geometric expansion matrix. And, um, and the canonical tiles can look like this. At the height didn't matter, I just made them the same. But the, the important thing, um, I mean, in fact, the heights have to be the same, right? Because there's only one vertical tile type. Um, and the horizontal are just in the tau to one ratio, like you would expect. All right, so you get an inflate and subdivide rule. So you inflate by, you take the tile, you inflate it by the matrix that we had. This is supposed to, it didn't, I should have rerun this with thicker borders, but this is two, a stack of two. And so the blue tile gets replaced by a stack of two reds. So instead of drawing figures for you that have a million letters in them, they look nicer in colors and make more sense. All right, so, um, so that's the, and so this is what I call a direct product substitution. Um, and so when I iterate it, it's not, nothing particularly interesting is happening. You get just copies of the Fibonacci tiling just stacked up. Um, all right, so what you can do is just rearrange a little bit. This is not, so I just am taking the upper row of the direct product and just switching the order. So I'm breaking that direct product structure and um, it's, everything's gonna fit just fine. And you end up with that time, you know, so you iterate, iterate, iterate. And as before you, um, you can consider these tiles as a sort of a pre-language and you say, okay, let's consider all possible tilings whose patches look like this. All right, so I thought it would be interesting to show um, how they compare, at least on a small scale. You can see, um, you know, of course, along the bottom, it's just ordinary Fibonacci. Going up the side does whatever. And <laughs> so I made this thing up and instantly, I mean, I didn't really, it already existed, but I 
I don't know, I drew it on the computer and realized that I wasn't entirely certain about the structure of these things. And I, there's been some discussion. I think it's, um, the rows are pretty clearly all Fibonacci sequences. Um, and I must, well, I think that could be the rows themselves might be as attic versions where you're looking at the ordinary Fibonacci or it's flipped. But all right, so here's the here's the the version of the staircase. So you can think of um, the A tile is this red cube face. Um, the B tile is this blue cube face. Um, you can run the substitution on that just like we did before. You just go A B A A B. Um, and put the little faces down like they go. And I really wish I could rotate these for you, which I was gonna, I have them up in Mathematica on my computer, but I can't, can't use my computer. Um, I would love to be, but I think you can imagine that if I rotated this, to the, if you were looking at, at it from the top, this one would look exactly like the staircase I made before. And this one, you know, these little holes, come into play, but none of them are very big. And so they're not really causing a huge problem in terms of any kind of finite local complexity or anything like that. Um, but when you look at it from the top, it kind of looks like just a gazillion staircases all stuck on top of each other. Okay. So that being the case, um, all right, so I only showed you three dimensions because that's what I can show you. And there's, <laughs> there's an issue with this one that makes the next slide sort of wrong um, in, in some sense. Um, oops, one thing that's wrong is that this right here should say one half. <laughs> I really wish it did, but it doesn't, but it really does. Um, so you can do the same kind of trick of embedding. So we know what to do with the Fibonacci. The Fibonacci has this weak eigenspace that goes with it, we'll project onto there and get a window. And, and so I sort of naively thought, okay, well, I'm going to need another dimension to go with the two dimension. Um, but this sent me into a can of worms because you, um, end up needing two attic integers in the, um, in the vertical direction to capture that portion of the window. And so what these pictures are of actually is um, I just made the iterated function system for this in exactly the same manner as I made it for the for the Fibonacci itself. And so the attractor of that iterated function. So, so this is what you get if you just use the direct product. It just looks like a stack of, and I think it's not exactly right for a couple of reasons. And then you get um, for the DPV, you get this um, strange thing, which I think is kind of the window in the sense that I feel, I think that at each level, it's telling you the window for the row that it's on, but I'm not entirely certain how that works. And I'd never seen this picture. And I, I should mention that uh, Bernd Singh in his thesis worked with these, with these kind of piatic um, windows. And so if you look in there, you will see, um, a plethora of really cool pictures, actually. <laughs> all right, so that's all I have to say about the Fibonoid. Um, I feel like I'm talking really fast. Does anyone want to ask me a question? Uh, can you explain uh, the slide again, uh, the previous uh, one? Uh, this one? How you Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you get the right one? Is it from the left? No, the it's, it's, it's actually from 
the DPV itself. So essentially you've got what you do, if you imagine here, hold on. Okay, focus on this corner, even though it's really, can you, can, can you see where I'm pointing? I hope mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. um, just focus on the little lower left corner. It's hard to see, but there's a, there's a red, blue, blue, red. Mm -hmm. And that's the substitution of the red facet. Uh -huh. I keep going the wrong way. No, I didn't. Okay, so, so it turns out that you can, um, so here's the red, blue, blue, red, and you can put them in three dimensions. Um, for some reason, I didn't draw the tiles. Um, don't worry, I'm not drawing a fractal. Maybe. So the way I have them is that the red one is like that. So these are two cube faces in R3. And so you, you end up with these pictures where you, um, it's actually really hard to draw the substitutions of these things by hand. It took me a, a while to, to visualize them. Shoes untying, but so the B one I can draw. So if it's oriented facing us, then it goes to the two A's that are coming out of the blackboard at us. And then the A, you know, so it's A, B, but then up here at the next level, it's gotta do the B first. And then the A. Is it? I hope that does enough. Um. Uh, so you gave uh, some angle to A in, instead of uh, uh, the horizontal it's, line. Yeah. So it's just a cube face. So you uh -huh. you will have seen these like the 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 French guys when they're doing. Um, the stepped surfaces and they use three cube faces, but this picture mm -hmm. comes, I only need two because I only use two letters for this example. Mm -hmm. And so you end up with these holes. And I've thought at length about whether you can fill these holes and still have it be a substitution, but I was never able to come up with a way to do it. Mm -hmm. Other stuff? After you describe the Fibonacci shift, you show some stairs. Mm -hmm. And this stairs remind us with the way you did the ten holes uh, mm -hmm. where you project uh, some five dimensional. Yep. Uh, on the dimensional space. Yep. It yeah, it's the same thing. Okay. Yep. That's. You're right there with me. <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, probably, probably they could hear it because you were on. <clears throat> so the observation was that this is what's happening to create the Penrose tilings. You have a five-dimensional lattice that looks like some kind of step surface, and you, I imagine, it looks like some kind of step surface. Right. So um, in these pictures, there's no fourth dimension, <laughs> but, um, but the idea that the lattice is invariant under the action of this, um, of, uh, under the action of the substitution matrix creates this geometric situation with the one half here. All right, so there's no results on that thing because just a little example. Um, okay, so Fibonacci DPVs. This is work um, that Uva and Misha and I did um, a couple years back. And so on this one, we're doing just Fibonacci crossed with itself. So you end up with four tile types. Um, and this is just the direct product. 
So if I were to look at this one here, so I'm running the B substitution horizontally, I'm running the A substitution vertically. And so you see the B just goes to A, but then A goes to AB. And so you construct all of the direct products just by running horizontally with the first one and vertically with the second. And again, you get um, canonical tiles and now, um, you end up with a, a big square of side length uh, tau here. You end up with a horizontal rectangle, you know, one by tau, and so on. And the little BB rectangle is just actually a, a unit square. All right, so this is the substitution, the Fibonacci DP along the um, along the top there. And then I just did a couple of little iterations. So that thing is a real inflate and subdivide rule. It just has linear expansion, the golden mean. Um, so volume expansion, you know, tau squared. Um, and this, this look here, is, <laughs> direct products always have this kind of appearance that looks like um, tartan or plaid or something. It suddenly occurred to me as I was making this talk that maybe uh, one could make a kilt, a Fibonacci kilt um, with the direct product. So this is the direct product. And so again, I want to break the direct product st structure. So this actually, oh, now I wish I had mentioned this, there's some work done on this. There's actually quite a bit of work done attempting to understand the spectrum of this and also um, uh, thinking about it from a Schrodinger operator perspective. So, so David Dominic and some of his co-authors have, and then also Ron Lipschitz um, have stuff on that. All right. so. Here's like a really basic variation. So I've just got the direct product along the top. And so the only change I've made is that I've swapped those two. And it's gonna fit because these two guys are the same height. So, it, and they're always gonna be the same height. So when I stick them in, so I'm not doing a ton here, um, but there's what it looks like when you iterate it a few times. It just, you know, Looks like that. Um, and so there's 40, 48 total ways you can fiddle around with those and get something that fits that you can iterate. Um, and um, right, so there's 48 total ways to do that. And a lot of them are what one would consider the same in some ways. And so the, one of the questions we were thinking about is just exactly what does the same mean? So these, these guys legitimately have a four dimensional space that, that the system embeds in. I think we call it the Minkowski embedding. Um, so you sort of make that staircase picture for the horizontal direction, but then there's also sort of a, a version of the staircase picture in the vertical direction. You end up with a four-dimensional step surface. Uh, well, yeah, you end up with a four-dimensional space um, with um, contractions in the weak eigenspace as before. Um, oh, wait, well, I got ahead of myself there. Okay, so there's 48 inflation tiling dynamical systems, like I said, um, and they're all, um, they're all measured theoretically isomorphic to each other because they all have the same point spectrum. Um, they're all model sets, which means we can compute windows. And this, this is one of those asterisks, asterisks that, you know, you need to read the fine print later. All right, and again, so you make this iterated function system pretty much in the same way as I did for the staircase to get your hands um, on the windows. Okay, so there's the Fibonacci DP, and, the, and this is the picture I got for the window using that iterated function system. 
which is not a particularly surprising picture. And you see that sort of inversion that comes when you diffract or when you, sorry, I don't know what I meant. Okay, and then that second example that I gave you, it's probably not particularly surprising that it does the thing that skews the window. And so 28 of the 48 variations give you these polygonal windows. Um, and you can see that they come with a, a couple of different slopes and varying degrees of apparent connectedness. And those, those have something to do with the fact that when we chose to think about this set, um, as a model, or as a as a point set in the plane, we 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 marked the lower left corners of all the tiles. So if you were to mark a different part on all the tiles, perhaps this would um, come out looking a little bit different. Um, so you do get different pictures for things that appear to be pretty similar. So those are the twenty eight polygonal windows. Uh, this is a really sort of hot off the presses or maybe not even in the presses yet uh, result uh, where Franz and Misha and um, Jan Mazak uh, were able to show that um, those 28 windows are all um, topologically conjugate. Um, but they're not mutually locally derivable which means that you need infinite, uh, well, you need arbitrarily large um, information to know um, what the conjugacy is. And that's a thing that happens in tiling dynamical systems that distinguishes it from symbolic systems, sort of lack of, of that theorem that says that topological conjugacy and local maps are the same in symbolic cases, that is not the situation here. Okay, so then what happens with the rest of them? So the rest of the, there's 20 left, I guess. And um, so I just put the direct product across the top. And so these three different versions create uh, rosy fractal windows um, that, are in, that are characterized into three types. Um, so right, would you like to? stare at that for a little while and see. The castle one is the most symmetric. It's just the same um, as the DP, but then these two horizontal ones are flipped, but very symmetric in that regard. The other two, you'll notice, you know, we have the flip like we saw before here, but then there's also flip, flip. All right, so um, this is for the island version that I just showed you. This is a big-ish patch of what the DPV tiling looks like. And this was the simulation of the window that I got. And the colors, of course, tell you are gonna just picking up, you know, the tile types while they're at it. Do it again for cross. You get that window. The really symmetric one was castle. And you get that. Always fun. And I made a little comparison slide. So um, which way did I go? I went the opposite of what I meant to go. So Bernd calculated the fractal uh, the Hausdorff dimension of the boundary for us. Um, and so we see the castle is, is gonna be um, well, like the most delicate <laughs> as it were. And this one looks really thick in comparison to me, to my eye. Oh, so um, Misha and Uva and I, uh, showed that this is this is really these are the remaining three classes. So you have um, all the polygonal windows, 
And those are all topologically conjugate. And then you have three more topological conjugacy classes that are coming out of the thing. That's all I have to say about the Fibonacci DPV, in case anybody wants to stop me. From the tiling. So the question is, how do you get the window from the tiling? Um, so you have to imagine, let's say that we're on this one. So you sort of imagine the staircase picture, like sort of a staircase picture for the horizontal one and a staircase picture for the vertical one. And then there's sort of, so you're in four dimensional space um, and you have the, the, the two dimensions that we added in are contracting. Um, and, um, and they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with the points that are here. And so you're like every point that's here, any vertex that's in one of these guys is, um, in one-to-one -one correspondence to a point on that step surface in R4, um, and that point, you know, so if I project it onto the big eigenspace, I get this, and if I project it onto the weak eigenspace, I get something in here. Other stuff? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Robbie. Hi, Natalie. Is, is, does this have something to do with a Markov partition for a certain four by four hyperbolic matrix? I mean, I'm hearing, I'm Markov hearing, yes. Most <laughs> so, of the Markov partitions are, are smooth, obviously, but then these three are, are fractal. So. Mm -hmm. Am I meant to remark on that? I'm not sure I can, but it looks, I'm seeing nodding in the audience. So perhaps, <laughs> perhaps that can be discussed at length further. Um, how am I doing here? Whoops. Okay. I think I don't have that much left to say, but we'll find out. Okay, so what happens when you, so it, let's leave Fibonacci land. Um, for a sec and see what happens. So um, this is my attempt at making a general definition of a direct product, product substitution. If you sit down and try to write notation to describe these things and how to iterate them, it's really not very fun, but that's why you just look at the pictures and then you know what to do. Um, but in general, you end up with an alphabet that's just the product of the two alphabets. You run the, the substitutions vertical and horizontal like before. Um, and you can easily just quickly get the canonical tiles. They're gonna be rectangles with the sides given by the natural tile lengths. And obviously I think, right, there's nothing special about being in two dimensions except for, it's already hard enough for me. Um, so a direct product variation is what you get when you start with a direct product and do some rearranging. Um, I've often been asked, well, how do you know they're gonna fit? I'm not gonna write a theorem telling you how to make them fit because I, I can't do that. Um, it's not clear to me. Um, so I wanted to just give you another example. This one is um, Robbie and K1 Park. This is from a while ago. Um, this is my interpretation of um, so this is the DPV interpretation. They did this work um, based on the Chacon cut and stack construction. Um, so they were doing ergodic theory. And um, the original idea was you had sort of an interval and then you had this extra spare interval for spacers. And you would, you would, you would make these stacks. And you'd, cut the interval into thirds, you'd stack them up, stack, stack, spacer, stack, 
cut the whole thing into thirds again, and you go stack, stack, space, or stack. And that's basically what this is. Um, and so the B is counting as what I said as a spacer, and you see that the B never expands. So this just, this is not primitive. Um, this example was made up, I think, to show an example of something that was weakly but not strongly mixing. Um, and so this is my DPV. I didn't bother drawing the DP for you. I thought you could probably live with that at this point. <laughs> if you're still with me, I think you probably, if you're, not, if you're not sleeping yet. And I just, all I did, I must have just switched. Um, or, well, I didn't do anything. They did it. Um, and the reason there aren't really canonical tiles for this one, if you try to like take the canonical tiles for that, is just all A. You get, um, so there's no proper inflate and subdivide rule to, to, to write here. And so when those guys were originally doing their work, um, they sort of visualized it more or less like this, except not in, not in shades of pink. And, um, and if you iterate it for a while, you, you get this. Um, and they proved that like the one dimensional version, that's uh, weakly mixing, but not strongly mixing. And it's, um, I mean, that wasn't, the motivation for the paper was um, self joinings and minimal self joinings, which is a uh, really interesting ergodic theory um, application. All right, so this here, this is the example that made me care about these in the first place. Um, so I was, I read Boris's Dynamics of self similar Tilings paper, where he characterizes when um, or when you are not going to have pure discrete spectrum based spectrum based on the expansion factor of the system. And so, and in particular, if that expansion factor was piezo, and I'm simplifying this a little bit, but if the expansion factor is piezo, then, um, then you're getting discrete spectrum and otherwise um, you're getting weak mixing, um, paraphrase. And so I thought, I thought I want more examples with non piezo expansion factors because I only knew the Godrech Lanson tiling. And I didn't really. So I said, well, let me just, you know, this will be easy. Um, and it is easy, right? But, um, but what happens is that it doesn't, it breaks apart. So these, so this figure has, you'll see this red circle here and then this green circle and this green circle. This is, this is stolen from my paper from 2008. Um, and what it is, is like, so if you focus your attention on this little blue tile and that pink tile, these two. So these two guys are adjacent, but at the next level, um, they're not close anymore. This is the substitution of the blue one. I see four goes to one, but this is where it ends up. Just when you do the when you do the direct product and iterate it, this blue one ends up here, but this pink one ends up down here. And what ends up happening is that this situation can occur in such a way that these guys are arbitrarily far apart from each other, and that means there's no way you can preserve when you when you pass to the canonical tiles. You're not going to be able to preserve finite local complexity, which means that Boris's result did not hold directly because he was in the context of finite local complexity. Um, I was pretty sure it's probably weakly mixing anyway, but um, it didn't fall into that paradigm. Um, so these are the canonical tiles, and this is how it comes out. And what ends up happening is, so wherever those ones were that I was uh, pointing at before, oh, so these two, I think these two are the circled ones and the blue one ends up here and it's right next to the one it's supposed to be next to. I think I could well be pointing at the wrong things. Oh no. Well, in any case. So 
So um, finite local complexity is an idea in tilings where you, um, you say that a tiling has finite local complexity if there are only finitely many two tile configurations. And you only need to check two tile configurations uh, is good enough. And so if you have infinitely many two tile configurations then you have infinite local complexity. And so at the time that Robbie and I were looking at that last tiling, so, so this, I think this thing is now known as the Frank Robinson tiling. It, what ended up happening was that I, I wanted to prove this thing was infinite local complexity and I just, I just couldn't figure out how to do it. And so Robbie and I finally were able to figure it out. And, um, but along the way we showed um, this theorem, which you should, fractagonal probably makes sense to you. Property C was some technical thing, but it was fairly general. But the, the point was that if you, so if the length expansion is piezo, so we were only considering the case where um, we were working with self-similar tiling, so the expansion in all directions was the same. And uh, we showed that if the expansion was piezo, then you were gonna get local finiteness for sure. So a corollary of that would be for something like the Fibonacci, um, you're gonna end up with, with finite local complexity no matter what. And we also managed to prove this thing is of infinite local complexity, which was nice. And it's, it's just a really nice, super basic example that you can create in that way. Oops. All right, so this is all I have. Um, so we've got some questions. Um, well, questions that interest me um, anyway. So there's, we have some partial results at this point on diffraction dynamical spectrum, you know, from, so this is sort of direct product variation questions. Um, so we have some partial results. There's more that needs to be done. Um, we don't have a general theory for the windows yet. I, I believe that um, other examples are possibly being worked on um, to try and understand just how that's gonna work um, in more general situations. And then the question of infinite versus finite local complexity. <laughs> so the, the version that Robbie and I did was just for self-similar. So it, it wasn't for cases where the expansion was different in different directions. And so, um, so our little result doesn't hold quite for that, but one would expect that if you're running um, piezo substitutions in both directions, that you're gonna get something that's um, finite local complexity, you have to assume. Um, and then if one, of, if one of the factors is, is not piezo, or maybe if both of the factors are not piezo, we know we can lose finite local complexity because we already had that example. Um, and we know that um, like the direct product substitution is always gonna have finite local complexity because they're just in complete lockstep, right? There's never any offsets. Um, and so you, so you can have, a non piezo, a strongly non piezo, right? So um, no eigenvalues equal to one or less, uh, no eigenvalues equal to one. Um, all right, forgot what, <laughs> I forgot what I was gonna say with that, um, but, but right, so the direct product substitution is always gonna have finite local complexity. And, and a question that I really just, <laughs> I'm just not sure whether if you take a direct product with one or both factors being non piso um, whether there are any non-trivial variations that would actually allow you to maintain final, finite local complexity. So that's, that's been a question that's bothered me for a long time. But anyway, all right, so that's all I have to say.